Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Morelius Mickelson. I'm the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning here in the district. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to learn about social emotional learning and ways that you as parents and guardians can support your students' social emotional needs. I hope that you find tonight's presentation helpful and informative, especially as we continue to grapple with the impact of the global health crisis and adjust to distance learning in the fall. We have a few of our amazing counselors as panelists tonight, and I will have them introduce themselves right now, starting with Louise. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Louise Berman, and I am beginning my 14th year at Seattle Hill. Uh, I have always worked with elementary students, and um, I'm looking forward to an exciting year. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Stinson. I am the school counselor at Machias Elementary. This is my 19th year as a school counselor and my fourth in the district. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing more information with you tonight. Thanks for being here. Hi, my name is Jamie Walton. I'm the um, school counselor over at Emerson Elementary. This is my third year as a counselor and I spent 15 years as a high school teacher before becoming a counselor. My name is Julie Ray, and I'm a counselor at Valley View Middle School, and I've been doing this for 15 years now. Thank you, counselors. So the presentation for tonight will last about 30 to 40 minutes. The rest of the time will be spent on questions and answers. I encourage you to write your questions on the Q&A box, and we'll do our very best to answer uh, whatever questions you might have. We are going to um, be here tonight until 7. If we're not able to answer your questions before 7, no worries. We'll post um, FAQs on our website. Also, also, uh, this is very important because of the nature of the topic and to protect our students' privacy, of course, uh, I encourage you to please write uh, or type up only general questions for tonight. So no specific information about your students' concerns or challenges, just general questions. And if you walk away from tonight's presentation feeling overwhelmed or unable to remember many of the details that we share with you, not to worry, we are here to help you. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time. The presentation tonight will be recorded, so you can always uh, go back and watch the video or the recording of the presentation, which will be posted on the district's website, Family Education YouTube channel. So without any further ado, I would like to now give the floor to Kelly Stinson. Thanks, Miriam. So we really wanted to walk through some goals with for you tonight. So looking at those goals, we want to kind of inform you a little bit about a lot of you hear about social emotional learning or SEL. So we want to explain to you a little bit about what that is if you don't know and have a little bit better understanding. And we're gonna delve a little bit into understanding and understanding developmental stages and um, things that are appropriate around anxiety and depression. We know a lot of students are experiencing that um, just in a normal setting, but with the pandemic and all the other things that are going on, we wanna make sure that you're aware of kind of all of those pieces that come along with, with those two um, mental health issues. We're gonna be talking about coping skills after that. So what can I do for my student? I'm a parent myself, so I wanna know what do I do now? So now I know something, so that's what we wanna share with you as well. And then last but not least, we're gonna give you some resources. Oftentimes we leave these presentations going, well, now what's next? And so we wanna make sure that you have some great resources to walk away with. What's important to know, just like Miriam said, this is gonna be taped tonight, but also know that our PowerPoint will be available to you as well. So know that you don't have to take copious notes if you don't want to, this will be um, available to you as well. So just thinking about our own social emotional well-being, I want you to take about 15 seconds, read what's on your screen, do what's on your screen. So make sure that you kind of make those shoulders, Release them a little bit, unclench your jaw, drop your tongue from the roof of your mouth. Just as a great way to kind of center ourselves. It's the third day of ma major online learning for most of you and your students. And I know, again, as a parent, that my jaw has been clenched quite often in the last three days. And so just giving our time, self time to take a deep breath and be ready and to really be able to take this information in. 
So let's talk a little bit about social emotional learning. <clears throat> so oftentimes it's referred to as SEL. And that really what that comprises is, is a process of developing the self-awareness, self-control, and interpersonal skills that are vital for school work and life success. So what that really is, is that inner circle that you're seeing. So self-management skills, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, and self-awareness. And we as counselors and even just family members know that really being able to handle and understand how to do all of those skills really helps benefit the student uh, academically, someday professionally, and even socially. So that's why we teach these things. It's really important. But as you can see too, on those outer blue circles, what's really important is yes, the classroom teaches it and schools teach it too as well, but really homes and communities play a really big role. We're all in this together. It takes a village to teach kids. And this really shows that these, um, these skills really do take a village to teach. Okay, thank you, Kelly. One more thing I would just wanted to add about the social emotional learning. The, one of the reasons at our school why we feel this big need to include it initially as students come back to school is that kids need to have their feelings validated. Um, they've been cooped up for so long that it's really important that our students get an opportunity to share um, how they feel. So that falls under their the self-awareness and the whole um, social awareness with other kids in their class and their classes. So it's important for us to give them that opportunity to share this, to acknowledge this so that they can move on and begin to learn because we know it's very difficult to do any academic learning if they're still tied up with those social issues. So looking at signs of depression, it's more common in uh, kids than we think, especially with young kids and with those who might have learning differences or attention issues. Um, and before I go on to what you might see, let me explain what depression is. There's so many definitions, but the one I found best is that it's a medical condition. It's defined as a mood disorder causing this persistent feeling of sadness and a loss of interest. Now, I know that we all feel sad and have the blues from time to time, but it's important in this case to notice the degree of sadness and the length of time that your child may be feeling this way. Um, are you seeing intense sadness? Are they feeling helpless or hopeless or even worthless? Does it last for many, many days or weeks? Does it keep them from living their normal life? So in cases like this, it could be clinical depression, which it's a very treatable medical condition. And I just urge everyone, if you're feeling that your child might be showing some signs of depression, please don't dismiss it. Call your pediatrician and just get a second opinion. So some of the major um, characteristics of this mood depression would be la loss of joyfulness, um, change in their daily habits, increased irritability. Do they have meltdowns a little more frequently than they used to? Have they lost some of their skills? Do all of a sudden they need you to help them tie their shoes? And what we see a lot in the nurse's office at school, this unexplained aches and pains. Students come in with stomach aches frequently. And after talking to them, I realize they're not sick. They are just dealing with nervousness or anxiety and are related to social issues, um, a fear of being judged by their peers. So there are more examples there and I'll let you read those on, on your own time. But going on to middle schoolers, very, very similar characteristics. The one that's added here is reckless behavior. And um, that includes cell phone behavior, online behaviors, um, in addition to just the loss of joyfulness and being irritable. And then going on to high school, you'll see that similar characteristics, 
but these numbers are much higher for high schoolers. The one that troubles me the most with high school students is not just the self-destructive behaviors, which we know could be um, drugs or smoking or cutting, again, online behaviors, but extreme despair. So parents, please don't ever ignore anything your child says, even if they sound like they're joking. Oh, I just wanna kill myself. That's something that we need to, right now, call your doctor, call 911, get another opinion. Um, most of our high schoolers know that parents are dealing with their own issues. So they'll try to back it up by saying, I was just joking. But um, if it ever gets to that point, please take them seriously. Okay, Julie, pass it over to you. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about anxiety because Luis just did a great job talking about depression. So I'm gonna start off with a quote, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. This is something to consider when we ourselves feeling stressed, and it's also a great conversation to have with your own kids. Oops. So definition, um, the, uh, the definition of anxiety is it's a mental health disorder characterized by feelings of worry, uneasiness, and fear that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities. Where anxiety gets really tricky is that it sparks an exaggerated stress response to non-life-threatening issues or situations. Anxiety is the most common mental health issue. It's the most common reason kids are in counseling. Untreated anxiety is one of the leading causes of depression. And anxiety impacts the social, academic, emotional, and physical areas of a person's life. Socially, Kids with anxiety are less likely to um, have a large group of friends. They might just have one friend. Um, maybe they don't like to leave their home and maybe they're unable to make those bonds with their friends like their um, peers with, without anxiety have. Um, academically, these students um, sometimes are, are thought to have ADHD, but it's really just anxiety and they're ruminating over these thoughts and they can't let them go. And while they're sitting there thinking these thoughts, they're missing instruction. Um, they don't really ask for help. And in extreme cases, they even decide to, to avoid school altogether. Emotionally, they live in fear. They feel isolated and they're less able to cope with their daily stressors. And then physically, this is where it gets really, really important is that um, they have a, a sense and a feeling of, of out of control and in their bodies, their stress hormones are, are going way up. But one thing to know is anxiety is very treatable. So this is the anxiety loop. This is where anxiety and your brain come together. So remember, there is a triggering event, and that triggering event is a non-life-threatening situation or event. And what happens is, is that all of a sudden triggers your amygdala. And when your amygdala gets trigger, triggered, there's, body, there's changes in your body that you're not even aware of. And this chain of events starts a physical response. So you are now, once your amygdala has been activated, you are now in a fight or flight mode, which means that there's lots of stress hormones running through your body. And some of the physical responses that you may feel is it increased heart rate, um, increased breathing, your senses are very heightened. So smell, sound, and sight, very heightened. Um, your skin might be sweaty, it might get cold, it might go pale, your hands and feet might feel tingly. Um, kids, uh, especially little ones, like they think that there's something wrong with their tummy because they feel anxiety in their tummy, but that's really just your body kind of putting the, di the digestive, sy digestive system on hold for a minute while it's trying to uh, move your blood to your major muscles and organs. And if you do not know what's going on with your body, this is terrifying for, for anyone and having all those symptoms together. And then you think a little child is going through that and maybe they're going through that in the classroom. So that's incredibly difficult. So then they get more worried thoughts. So now they're not only worried about their triggering event, they're worried about what's going on in their body, which makes the um, physical reactions uh, more intensified. 
and then that you're just destined to repeat this cycle because you don't know how to break the loop. So what is anxiety, anxiety wants from you? Anxiety wants to be in charge and it wants to make sure that it, it will not do anything unless you have 100% certainty and control. And we know that this is unrealistic in real life, which means that kids um, and people with anxiety end up not even starting things because they don't, they don't have 100% certainty or, or control that they're gonna finish them. They have rigid, catastrophic, and global thinking. Rigid thinking, it's kind of thinking with your blinders on. Um, you have one thought, and even though all the evidence may say um, contrary to what you believe, you still believe in your one thought. Um, catastrophic thinking is when you're magnifying something way out of proportion. And global thinking is when you don't have the ability to really cipher through your um, emotions and your feelings and your thoughts. So they're all just kind of swimming in your head. So together, th this is really challenging for someone who has anxiety um, to be having those kind of um, tendencies in their thinking. A permanent mindset means that they really feel like this is not gonna change. This is gonna be something that they have or, or they have to deal with the rest of their life. When in reality, the, there's just missing skills that we can help them with. Um, anxiety wants external reassurance. Parents, I'm sure you know this without a doubt, how many times your kids want you to um, uh, uh, check the lock one more time or ask you, do you have enough gas in your car? And worry, some of that's okay because they're just checking. When it becomes an issue is when they repeat it over and over and over again. And external reassurance is actually a, a compulsive act to reduce anxiety. Um, so some things to know about that is no matter what you say or do, you will never give them enough external reassurance. Um, and by trying to provide that rec um, external reassurance, you're really creating um, a hole for them to be able to rely on themselves. And one of the biggest culprits of external reassurance is your cell phone. So, and, then, and we already kind of talked about avoidant behavior where students may um, refuse to go to school. Um, they may be checking um, things on their phones and checking out of school. But we also need to think about the perfectionist who will start a project but never be able to turn it in because it's not done 100%. So we see avoidant behavior in all sorts of areas. Some help with how having to deal with your student with anxiety is some emotional management. So let's be talking about that triggering event. Is that a real event or is that a perceived event? Really trying to get the your student to think about, is this a life-threatening situation that needs to get the amygdala activated? Or is this just a situation that we can handle with some more skills? Um, pivoting thinking. We are gonna challenge the rigid and catastrophic and global thinking that these kids have. So really trying to change their, their opinions and have them see the evidence and then also have them believe that things can change. And we wanna encourage flexibility. So we are gonna take anxiety head on, and this might mean um, setting some goals. Like if your child is worried about their dog and they are um, constantly texting you throughout the day about the dog, make a pact with them. You can text me one time today and I'll answer, but then that's all. So really trying to put a limit on that external reassurance. And then to focus on the process and not the content. The content can change. And we all like to, to know why someone starts having um, some of these issues, but when they're in the middle of it, that's not the important thing. We really need to focus on the process of helping the kids be able to step out of that anxiety loop and calm themselves down. And we need to get out of the reassurance trap. And I know this is really hard, I'm a parent, and I, I just, you want to be able to provide that, but in providing that all the time, you're really taking away your child's ability to do that for themselves. So some tools that you might wanna use is um, some deep breathing. Uh, we call it breathing four and four, where you breathe in for four and you breathe out for four. And kids can do this while they're at their desk and no one knows, so that's why it's a really handy one for kids to, to have while in school. Heavy hands is when you put your hands on your legs and you do that deep breathing, but then you concentrate on how heavy your hands are getting and that there's really just pushing your legs to the ground and you're just concentrating 
solely on how heavy your hands are getting and your deep breathing. And that will turn the focus from being in a state of fight or flight to being calm. We want to set goals with our kids. So like I said before, if you have a, a kiddo who's really wanting external reassurance, setting that goal, you can text me once today about the dog and I will respond, but then that's it. So setting goals, you're acknowledging the fact that they're worried about their dog, but then we're going to set some goals around that. Um, having kids write out this, um, I, I usually have a note card that I hand to kids um, and it says, I want, and I have a space, so I am willing to blank. Um, so a prime example of this would be a high school student who really wants to go to college, but right now um, they can't turn into work because it's not perfect. And so they're failing their classes. So what are they willing to do to get to go to college? Well, maybe they're willing to turn in their assignment, even though it may not be 100% like they thought it would be. Um, 10 good things. It's easy to look back at your day and find one or two good things. And um, to be honest, when kids with anxiety, they come home and they have some of that global thinking of my day was horrible, no one likes me. It's gonna be really hard for them to um, really come up with 10 good things, but it's gonna be really important because then they'll spend time thinking about their day and thinking about what made them happy and really changing their mindset from being negative to finding the good in their day. And as Julie was saying, those are some really great strategies for your secondary students, middle school, high school students. But uh, when we have little people in our lives, it's a little bit harder. Some of those things don't always work as great. So here are some tips for you if you have littler people, kindergarten through fifth grade, I'd say. Just what, what can we do as a parent? What can I do when my kid's in that loop? So I really like some of these kind of sentence starters. I'm here and you're safe. Sometimes that's all you need to say and just hold them to let them know you're there. That's your, your physical reassurance, but not your words, right? Um, drawing it out. Can you draw out your anxiety? Um, one of the ones I really think is important, especially if you're in, if your students in your in the anxiety loop, I like number seven, match your breath to mine. So you're providing the example of how they should be breathing because their their body is ramped, they've got the adrenaline surging. So it's really important that you slow down their breathing and have them match that and that will help them regulate a little bit better. Another one is let's go take a walk. Let's go jump on the trampoline. Let's go take a run around the house. So letting that adrenaline, because they've had a giant adrenaline dump because the amygdala has been activated. So finding ways to let that get out of their body quickly so that you can start having those conversations of what can we do to make you feel better now that you're kind of out of the loop. So I really suggest kind of looking at those and using some of those as you move forward with your student if you have an anxious student. So along that same line, Julie talked a little bit about breathing. I'm gonna do the same too. So we know that I often think that when I talk to kids about kind of that amygdala and when it's, when it's activated is imagine you're sitting in your recliner at home and everything's good, you're watching your TV, you are calm, your body's relaxed, you're breathing slow, your heart rate's great. And imagine that a Tyrannosaurus Rex showed up. Your amygdala is gonna activate, all the stress hormones are gonna run through your body and it's gonna be really hard. And what we know is that one of the greatest things that a student can do, or us ourselves, is we can really work on our breathing because it really does do a great job of activating, kind of deactivating some of those things that have been activated. And so when we talk to kids, oftentimes I'll talk to them and they're like, oh, breathing. And they think it's, they kind of roll their eyes. But really, it does a really great job to, physiologically to do that. So some things that you can do, Julie gave you the four and four. But here's some that you can do with little people. Um, if you have bubbles in your home, it's a great thing to get those bubbles out because to be able to blow a bubble, you have to go slow and regulate your breathing to get the bubble in and out. So that can be one that you can practice with students. The one, the next one is using a stuffed animal. So I like to call this ocean breathing. This one's really great for at home is what you do is you have your student lay on the floor and you put a, you pick out a stuffed animal and put it right on the tummy as they're laying on the floor. And then you're really gonna practice those deep belly breathing because what you want your student to do is to deep, deep breathe, not shoulder breathe, but deep breathe through the diaphragm. And if they do that, then the teddy bear is gonna raise up when they breathe out or breathe, breathe out. And when they breathe in, it's gonna go down. So you're really, you're making that teddy bear or whatever stuffed animal, it looks like they're on an ocean. They're kind of going in and out. So that can be a really great way that you can teach your student um, how to do deep breathing. The last one is another great one. If you can print out the picture, there's lots of great um, variations of this, triangle breathing, mountain breathing, but lazy eight breathing is another one that students respond to really well. So all you have to do is have a sideways eight like you see on the screen. You have your student put their finger on the middle 
and they breathe in as they go around and they breathe out as they go. Now you're always, you're always um, making sure that they're not doing fast. When I teach this to kids, they always wanna go, <gasps> well, that's not gonna work. So it's really about going nice and slow, regulating the breathing to really kind of help that stress response really lower pretty quickly. And if I could just piggyback on that, Kelly, one of my favorites um, is getting kids to hold their finger up, pretend it's a birthday candle. And I don't want you to blow it out, but I just want you to get it to wiggle, that wick move. So it's very controlled and they do it three times. So they know they can't blow it out, but again, controlled breathing. And that just tends to, first of all, they think it's funny, but they will generally bring us back to at least some point of communication, which I wanna to talk to you about. Um, it is very difficult to talk to our kids when you're so worried about them. Are they depressed? Are they dealing with anxiety? Do they have problems with friends? All these social events, all this that's going on in their young lives, how do we communicate with them? Well, we need to make sure, first of all, we're giving them what they want from us. So a smart thing to ask is, do you want me to just listen to you? Or are, do you want me to help you? Are you looking for some advice? Um, so many times we assume that we're there to answer their, their questions and solve their problems for them. So one thing to, I try to remember, mom, just please listen and stop trying to solve all my problems. I think our kids just want us to be there and acknowledge and validate how they're feeling in that moment. So a good tool is active listening and take this shift from helping them solving their problems to actually listening. Active listening is not a teachable moment. Please remember that. So eye contact, let them know that you're right there with them. You're not looking at your phone. You're not doing anything else. You're not making dinner. And then you wanna to say to them things like, is this what you mean? Am I understanding you? And reflective listening is so powerful because you use the exact same words that they tell you. So what you're saying is she rolled her eyes at you and then she ran away. And a lot of times that's not what they said, but if it is, they're so pleased that you get it and they, that you understand them and that, yes, I heard you. Am I understanding you? Tell me more. Is there anything else you want to tell me? And then wait. And sometimes that silence is powerful because our kids need time to process what they're going to say. Silence doesn't mean I have to jump in and say something. I have to do something else. Wait a minute, give them time. Okay. So active listening, again, we're encouraging them. Put your judgments aside. This is not the time for that. Um, that's a difficult thing to do, especially when they finally open up and tell you what's going on. Um, just encourage and listen. Okay, I understand. And a lot of times using just a brief encourager lets them know, you hear me. Oh, thank goodness she heard me. Just nod, okay, wow, mm -hmm. All right. And let them do the talking. So we don't want to enable our kids. And for many, many mothers, and I've seen this a lot, who have girls having girl problems, um, middle school, sixth grade, fifth grade, mothers want to come in, I'll take care of it. I'll call her mom, you're going to go to that sleepover. I'll take care of it, don't worry about it. You don't need that friendship. Those are enabling, they're not help, helping at all. What we really need to teach them is how to empower them. So we want to encourage and empower them. Again, we're not solving their problems. I have faith in your ability to solve this. I've lived with you all these years. I know you have the ability to do this. Sounds like you've gone through some, some tough times and you've thought this through. I'll always be here to listen to you. I think one of you said that earlier. If you need my help, I'll do my best to help you. I may not have all the answers. And I can't imagine what you're going through. Empathize with them. I am just so sorry that you have to be dealing with this. It's 
So a little bit of coping. Um, how do we help our kids? Uh, you know, what's the most important aspects of coping? We don't want them to feel isolated. And right now it's so easy for them to feel isolated. So pay attention to taking care of your body. Let's eat well, exercise every day, as difficult as it is, do something, make sure you're getting enough sleep and try your best to connect with others. Right now they're back in classes, so they are connecting. But even on the weekends, if you could just call your friend or have a Zoom or play a game with someone, some kind of connecting, we need those connections. If I might jump in, it's something to kind of watch for too, as we talk about anxiety and depression, that your students are still connecting with their friends. Um, it's one of the things we noticed uh, at the end of last year that some students were just kind of disengaging from everyone and everything. So making sure you're keeping kind of an eye on who are they connecting with? How are they connecting? Are they connecting with their friends? And how can you help if they aren't? And another thing to kind of think about um, how they connect. I know when I grew up, my mom sent me out to play and that's how we would play. All the neighborhood kids, we were outside. Kids now are connecting through the Xbox and through their video games. So while we wanna monitor and make sure they're not playing those all the time, but that is a way that they are connecting with their friends. Good point. Okay, so um, there's gonna be times when there is a problem and it may be on beyond our scope within the school as a school counselor and assisting them. And that's when we wanna be able to give you referrals that are either out to the community or out through Washington State or even nationally. So we were gonna list a few of them here, but um, there's a lot more of them out there that we have that are referrals to different agencies that might be able to help um, with different problems that are happening with your um, student. And so if you go out to the school district website, um, they have a list of them there, but also reaching out to us, the school counselors, um, that we also carry, have these resources readily available to email to you, um, printed off, ready to go in the office too. So if you needed them, they're there for you. And there's a few more. These are great resources that you put together, Jamie, and most of us have them posted on our Canvas pages or our websites. Yeah. And we also want to acknowledge too, right now it's really, with, it usually is difficult to get mental health resources for young people. It's not always an easy feat. We understand that it's difficult, but we're here to help as much as we can. And so we really try to provide you a long list of resources. Um, to be able to get you, because sometimes waiting lists, especially in the midst of this pandemic, waiting lists have been a little bit longer than they were in the past. So we acknowledge that we'll help in any way that we can. So just wanting to list kind of our district, kind of who is your school counselor, if you don't know already, we just wanted to put together a list of those for you. So these are our elementary counselors and their contacts our middle school counselors and their contacts, and then our high school counselors and their contacts, just to make sure that you're aware of who they are. And if you need us, we're here. Um, we're always a great starting point. All right. Uh, now that you have, th well, thank you panelists. Thank you counselors. Um, before we jump to question and answer, and again, I encourage you to type your, answer, uh, your questions in the uh, Q&A box. Um, but before we go to the questions, I just would like to share with you some of the things generally that our schools are doing to support social emotional learning. At the elementary level, our teachers are providing uh, social emotional lessons in the classroom. Our counselors are doing uh, social emotional lessons in small groups and in classrooms. And they're also uh, doing um, social emotional support through small groups or individually. Teachers are using daily class meetings or circles to create healthy connections in the classroom. And they're also providing resources to parents through Canvas Seesaw Pages um, on SEL teaching at home. 
And at the middle school, our schools have established a homeroom that allows space for students to not only discuss academics, but on some of their social emotional needs as well. Our counselors are pushing into and discussing um, SEL in their health uh, classes. They're also doing groups um, and they're focusing on uh, soft skills, those attributes that allow our students to interact effectively. Uh, with others and our counselors are me meeting individually with students as well. Um, same as the at the high school, uh, meeting individually with students, they're sending videos and emails to students and families with resources. And they're also setting up Canvas pages with each graduating class. And those include lessons and resources for planning. So those are just some of the ways that our schools are providing social emotional learning. And I encourage you to please reach out to your students counselor if you have any questions about um, their schooling or if you just would like to talk a little bit about a little bit more about uh, their social emotional needs. Thank you all so much for being here, for spending time with us and learning about SEL. And thank you to our wonderful, amazing counselors for, for putting this presentation together. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.